What's up, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. I'm Scott Bear. That's Steve frickin' Weish in Flowery Branch at the brand new Ticketmaster Studios, which which you just toured. Thank you so much for coming up, man. Well, this well, is well, a th- big day for us. Well, thanks for having me. I mean, these studios, come on. This is like NFL Network. We got some new studios there two years ago, and this is pretty spectacular. I mean, great investment by the ball club. It's going to make your life a lot easier, make oh, things yeah. a lot easier for everybody here. Yeah, and it's going to be fun to see. We, we've had so many of the Falcons' new free agents come in, sit in that chair that you're sitting in right now. Pretty soon, we're going to have the number eight overall pick. At least that's where they're slotted right now. The NFL draft is coming up. The Falcons currently have eight selections, one in the first round, second and third rounds, two in the fourth. They just traded a fifth-round pick for a guy named Jeff Okuda, who we're going to get into that later. Um, But this is a pre-draft show, Steve. But how can you talk about the draft unless you talk about what's been done before it because all that kind of funnels into what they could do at number eight and on day two and on forward. So before we go forward to the draft, let's go back and talk about what the Falcons did with the second-highest amount of salary cap space in the league out of getting after – getting out of salary cap H-E double hockey sticks, right? <laughs> That's right, after they've been in right. prison, in salary cap prison for a while. Yeah, so what's your take on – I mean, there are so many moves, so many to list. But right. What, like, what was your take overall about what Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot were able to do since the league year started? Well, clearly they said, okay, we have some pillars on our defense, but now it's time to fill in the walls, right, to, to, to build the walls. So going in and, and getting David Onyemata from the Saints, I think he's a stud. You know, when, when people signed it, it didn't, it didn't cause a lot of headlines, but that dude's a hell of a player. Mm-hmm. Right. And, of course, Ryan Nielsen, the new defensive coordinator, comes over from New Orleans. So you got Anyamata, Grady Jarrett, then they had Calais Campbell. That was a huge get in it's my It's a huge opinion. get because of the position flex, right? He can play inside. He can play outside. If you got, if it's a, if it's a run-type situation, a goal-line situation, move him outside, really get heavy up front. So that's a nice pickup. But then on the back end, you get Jesse Bates, right? A true free safety. Guy with a lot of range, but he can come up in the run game. But that will allow Richie Grant to kind of be more of that rover in the middle. You know, Richie likes to come down and stick people and do things. So that will give him that freedom to play some strong safety principles. Let's not forget the fact that they went out and they acquired Johnny Smith, a tight end. To me, that really is going to change what they do offensively because now you've got tight ends who can block, tight ends who can flex. You've got a big wide receiver with Drake London. I think they still have got to add at least one wide receiver in the draft, at least, mm-hmm. and someone who can go, like someone who's got, you know, some blazing speed who can really get there and open things up. And, and, and so, you say to yourself, okay, how does this affect the draft? Well, they're not going to go ahead and draft a defensive tackle high. They're right. stacked there, right? Even though Calais Campbell's on a, a one-year deal, you know, Grady's probably got two more years. You're good there, okay? How does you know you're not going to draft a safety high? There's not one to draft high anyway, but mm-hmm. you're going to stay away from that position on defense. You're going to stay away from tight end, and you're going to stay away from offensive line because you you already have your anchors on the left, and you resigned Caleb McGarry and Chris Lindstrom on the right. So that's how free agency kind of sets the table for the draft, and you've already committed to Desmond Ritter to being your starting quarterback. So that takes that position off the plate as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you can start to see that the quote-unquote pressing needs are getting smaller and smaller. Correct. And I think that that's the objective. So you can walk in there at number eight and be like, okay, we feel confident wherever we are, but where can we add? Where can we bring in a player to develop or enhance? Um, the latest moves by the Falcons, uh, trade of a fifth-round pick to Detroit for Jeff Okuda. Right. Everybody knows him, the Ohio State guy, number three overall pick, yep. right? So you have that. And then maybe you can go one, two here. You have that one. And then uh, a very recent one, as we're recording this, is, you know, the the uh, reported addition of outside linebacker slash pass rusher Bud uh, Dupree, who everybody knows, another first-round pick uh, coming in. Does Do those guys influence number eight? Well, two, two part. Do you like those moves? And do they influence what's done at number eight? Or are those things independent? Uh, That's they're not, a lot they're, of stuff they're, there. No, no, but they're not. They're not independent. Mm-hmm. Um, first off, I like the moves. Yeah, I don't think either one of them's necessarily going to come in here and, and and be a savior type of player. Right. Um, you know, Bud Dupree, someone who's been injured a lot the last couple of years. He had a couple really flashing years in Pittsburgh. They let him go. He's had some go and had some injuries. He's with Tennessee. Got a big contract there. Just hasn't been on the field. So he's going to have to come in and compete for a spot. I don't think he's got a, a, a given. Here, knowing that they've got you know Ebiketti, they've got Malone, they've got some players there mm-hmm. 
who aren't just going to let this thing go. Sure. So he's got to compete for a roster spot. He's got to make this team. I don't think it's a shoe in um, And then when it comes to Jeff Okuda, I think he makes the team. I think this could be worse news for Casey Hayward. Um, right. But we don't know. You know, look, that's going to be a competition thing to see what happens there. But then, he, you know, it's, it's going to be a competition. Okuda's got a lot to prove. This is a one-year prove-it season for him. He's got one year left on his deal. Things did not materialize for him in Detroit. And remember, this was the Detroit team last year that had two rookie sack masters and James Houston and Aiden Hutchinson have some really good defensive back coaches as well. So I'm really wondering how things are going to work out for Okuda here, which is why I don't think either one of these moves influences at what the Falcons could do with that eighth overall pick. Yeah, because when you look at it, especially guys – both of the guys that we're talking about are one-year deals. Right. Even Campbell, who's 106, maybe. He's close. But he's he'll be working <laughs> NFL Network after this year. I mean, <laughs> w- talk about us. His voice could like, oh yeah. Oh, can make like water shake on the table, basically. It, it coming from a six-nine frame. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. But you, so you have some of the, the these guys on one-year deals. You, you're not thinking necessarily long-term with that. I think maybe it helps you up front but then you look at it and the, I've been getting a lot of questions in the mailbag well so does like does the Jeff Okuda trade eliminate Christian Gonzalez or or Witherspoon I don't think so no I I don't think so at all I don't think so at all because again especially if it's a Devin Witherspoon this guy hits like with, a safety hits like a safety can play in the slot can play outside but the fact he's got the position flex and we're seeing this more and more in the NFL now since teams are nickel all the time, is you're finding that guy, Jalen Ramsey does it, Derwin James does it, kind of that star player, right, who can play safety on one play, who can move into the slot on the next, who can play corner on the next. and the, But, you know, they're, they're responsible a lot. Charles Woodson used to do this big time in Green Bay with some outside linebacker responsibilities in the running game. Interesting. Wither, Witherspoon can do all that, right? So if, you, if, you, if Okuda does win the job and you've got A.J. on the other side, Guy like Witherspoon coming right in the slot. You've got some speed, some youth, and a lot of a lot of range in that backfield, right? And so that could be a possibility. And then if it's not a corner, I mean, even if it's Christian Gonzalez, he's more of an outside corner. He's got size. Yeah, he's rangy. He's big. He's, he's and got ideal that way. A little taller than AJ, but got kind of the same type of frame. Got that great speed. We saw the forty time. Um, can get his hands on the ball. Willing tackler as well. So I think. Corner, to me, is a very, very ripe spot. In fact, I think that's a position if one of those guys is there. But then edge. Yeah, that's right? the thing. If a guy like Tyree Wilson is there, and I'm not so sure he's going to be there I think that might by, be the, tough. Time, by yeah. the time they pick. But if a guy like that is there, that's you see yourself like, okay, we have bodies, but we don't have at either of those positions. Well, A.J. Terrell's a difference maker. Yeah. But at the, at the edge, we don't have that one guy who can win. Mm-hmm. Right, we've got to do some things to get you know. Ebiketti's got to manufacture some pressure sometimes, and he's just got to out effort guys. You got a guy like Tyree Wilson who can win. That's a game changer, right? So now, corner or edge, those are two high priority positions throughout the NFL. If you get a stud rook corner to go with AJ Terrell, how are you going to pay him both? Don't worry about it because AJ's up next year. Mm-hmm. Got a rookie on a five year deal. That's how you. Pay, that's how you have two stud corners right there exactly. who are both young. Edge rusher, same way. They need a guy who can win off the edge. They have not had that guy since John Abraham. So, and that's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> that's back when I was covering them for the Falcons for the AJC. So I, I think those are the two spots, depending who's available, where the Falcons go in the draft. Uh, uh, but yeah, well, but I'll, I'll, I'll save. I'll save it. Right? Are we saving uh-huh. it for later? Yes, we, we we'll are. Save it for I later. I can't wait to get that one. So okay. yeah, stay tuned. Um, so I was talking to Terry Fontenot at the league meetings Mm -hmm. and I the question I asked was do you need to add more pass rushers this was obviously well before the Bud Dupree thing and everything and what you know he didn't necessarily give me the exact answer Terry Terry didn't divulge yeah like what a shocking (laughs) revelation but he basically said we never want to feel desperate and I think what going going back to the Okuda move and and the uh, Dupree move is you feel like you don't feel desperate at number eight. Like if, if it, if the board falls to you and you're not like, we have to have a pass rusher or we're in big trouble or we have to have a corner or we're in huge trouble. I think that these moves take away some desperation at some of those spots so they can feel comfortable sitting there and be like, okay, Wilson's gone. Gonzalez may be gone, but 
Witherspoon's right there, great. And we can survive on the right. defensive front, maybe waiting till 44 or even 75, right? It gives them a little more confidence heading into the draft as opposed to we got to get Got to get thing. that guy. And what else, what else they've done? Like you look at the talent up front, right? Suppose they don't go edge up front. Well, you still got enough guys to put pressure on the quarterback. Like I said, you got position flex where you can have Grady Jarrett, Anyamata, Clayus Campbell on the field at the same time with Arnold Ebiketti or whoever's on mm-hmm. that side, right? Or, or if you go five man, you could do that. What does that do? It allows you, if you have a rookie at corner, to say we we can put enough smoke on the quarterbacks, or we we can give him time to develop. And I use the 49ers model. Mm-hmm. They put all of their resources in their front seven. The guys in the on the back four, we like them, but we don't have to have a great, great secondary. You know, they finally invested in Shadarius Shader- Ward mm-hmm. last year at corner, but they they say let let's put the smoke up front. You know, so it's it's either way, but I think they've done enough up front, like you said, and enough on the back end as to where, okay, we'll get whatever we can get. The guy's going to take a while to develop, or if he's going to be an immediate impact guy, we have fortified those key areas of the defense. And again, folks, Ryan Nielsen's coming over from the Saints. What were the strength of the Saints? You had the guys up front and the guys on the back end, right? They always had safeties who they didn't want to pay, but they went elsewhere Mm -hmm. and made money. Marcus Williams, all these guys who were fantastic players. That's how they built the defense. Look what the Saints have done. That's what the Falcons have done. Fortified up front. With big dudes. With big, The Saints form a wall, right? Form a wall. And and their ends, I mean, Cam Jordan and uh, Davenport, who's no longer there. Mm -hmm. Trey Hendrickson, like big dudes. Yeah. Who come off the edge. So don't look for the Falcons to draft a 235 pound edge guy. Yeah, probably not. If they go high, it's going to be someone with some beef on his side. And Tyree Wilson has that. About 260. Uh, yep. Lucas Van Ness has yeah. that. I don't know if he's maybe number eight, maybe a trade down, but nonetheless, th- there are right. guys with size that fit this scheme. And that's kind of what it's about as you proceed through this thing. Um, as we look at it from a national perspective with the top eight. You hear so much about, are we going to see quarterbacks in the top four? Right. Uh, could we at least see them in three of four? Arizona seems like that's a perfect trade down spot. Oh, yeah. What's your take on the top of the draft before the Falcons line up at eight? How could that shape up, do you think? It's so intriguing because you don't know what the Colts are going to do at four. Hmm. Right? Interesting. I think that's where the draft starts. All right. The first two picks are either going to be Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud. I'm not buying any of the stuff. Well, the Houston could pass at a quarterback at two and maybe move up from 12. Why? Yeah. Why? That's if you have crazy. a chance to get one of those two guys, you go ahead and do it. D'Amico Ryans, he's got some bandwidth, some years to work with. So quarterbacks here at three, Arizona, I think someone's going to come up. There's just too much chatter out there. Someone's going to come up and try to get a quarterback, whether it's Will Levis whether it's Anthony Richardson, we don't know. But let's say Arizona keeps the pick, okay? So there's Will uh, Anderson, Anderson yeah. from Alabama. He's He's got to be the guy. Has right? to. So then the Colts at four, what are they going to do? Are they going to grab one of these quarterbacks? They've got to get a quarterback. They haven't made any type of move. So you think they're going to take one of these quarterbacks, but good grief, does somebody come up? And say, you know, why don't you move back a couple of spots? You know, it, it, it's it's just really weird. And then at five, we've got uh, Seattle. Seattle. Seattle's real interesting now. Mm-hmm. Like that's where someone like a Tyree Wilson could go. Yeah, that's what I was but, thinking too. But they've never picked this high under Pete Carroll. They've never picked this high under Pete Carroll. Yeah, because they they have a reputation for a picking lower and b getting out of those spots. Getting right? out, yeah. I mean, the highest they picked is sixth. And they wow. took Aaron Curry back in Pete Carroll's first year. <laughs> wow. But it's, That's a name from the past how about right there. That? It goes through how long Pete Carroll's been coaching up there, too. <laughs> but it's it, it's real intriguing. I think they go D-line. So let's take Tyree Wilson off the board there. At six, we have got Detroit. Detroit. And you got Jalen Carter just floating out there. Yeah, I mean, he seems like a perfect fit for what they want to do. There's just so much stuff out there. That you got to account for, right? You got to account for. So you don't know if if they say we've got the type of team that can absorb him and nurture him and grow. I think they do because you've got the young guys I mentioned, James Houston and Aiden Hutchinson on that offensive line, Frank Ragnow, Panay Sewell. Like, if this guy doesn't love football, they'll beat it into him. If he does, if he does, <laughs> yeah. love, if he does love football, they'll stand up. Like they've got enough youth and veteran leadership, but overall toughness to kind of figure out what he is. But 
You still don't know. But okay, let's go ahead and put Jalen Carter there. You got the Raiders at seven. They're go they're either going quarterback or corner. Right. Right. They've got to get their secondary is terrible. Right. So let's go ahead and give them either let's just say Devin Weatherspoon. Sure. Okay. So then Christian Gonzalez is sitting right there at eight. There's either going to be a pass rusher or a corner right there for Atlanta to take it eight. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not taking a quarterback, so everyone get get rid of that. Okay. Right there. Uh, the, you know, wide receiver's tempting. It is tempting, but I just don't know if they would go that high because there's just if no – they go tight end or pass catching tight end, wide receiver, wide receiver? I, I just don't know. There's just nobody like the Drake London tight end. There's, no, there's just not that guy out there when you talk yeah, to some right. of these, these scouts. There's just not that amazing group like we saw last year. So – um, I, I just that's why I think it's going to end up being a corner when I think the way the draft is going to fall. You know, the, the, the Colts are just such a wild card. What are they going to do? Because if they draft one of these quarterbacks and then now someone like the Titans at 11 might come up. Right. right? They might come up to five to Seattle. Right. Or they, they might come up to six to Detroit. Those teams will drop back in a heartbeat. Sure. So – you know, again, that that could push one of these pass rushers down. Mm-hmm. So I think that's – it's going to be a very interesting front end because do the teams like these quarterbacks as much as we in the media think they do? That's always such an intriguing part of it, right? Right, because guys don't move up and down draft boards. That's just the, the media mock drafting them one <laughs> way. And then when they fall or they rise, oh, see who rose up? No, it does, that didn't happen. But I've just talked to too many people who think that these quarterbacks – are going to probably be gone in the top six. Interesting. Yeah. Which so, let's say you're Falcons GM, mm-hmm. right? And it's fallen. And whether there's a quarterback or no, if if there's a quarterback free when you hit to eight, or maybe not, is your phone like on? Like you checking your I'm caller checking. ID all the time? I, I'm, meaning I'm, I'm, like, I'm, are you willing to move down from there? Or you think? Oh, a thousand percent. Yeah. Why wouldn't they? Yeah, right? I mean, why because, not pick up more assets plus a guy? Yeah, I mean, it's one of these things, like, let's say the Titans want to come up from 11, move back to 11, right? Then you've got some edge rushers. you got the young man out of Clemson, maybe that's a little high. I don't know. But if he fits your scheme, he does physically. Right. Scheme, fits your scheme, fine. Want corner? Joey Porter. Right? There's guys there. Like, those. there's, there's three corners who are top 15 talents. Right? So if you're picking at 11, no shame in that game. No way. Right? Luke Van Ness. He could be there, yeah. you know, at some, no shame in that. Plus, you pick up more draft capital if you move back. So, I, I think – no, I think – I, I, I don't think they would lose any sleep if they had to move back three, four, five spots. Yeah, I mean, if that's the scenario, if you can get one of those guys plus an additional asset in 24 or maybe down in the draft, mm-hmm. I think that's a huge win because you've got these top-tier guys. Like, if Wilson's on the board – I'm turning my phone yeah. off. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm just handing in the selection, right? <laughs> right? But if you move down and you're like, okay, well, could I get Murphy or Van Nett? You can right. start playing with it. But I'm not going to 20. No, no, no. You're not, you're not I'm moving. In a, there's you're a not little moving out, You're not moving beyond 13. Yeah, that's probably that. fair. Yeah. So you're probably checking in with Nashville, maybe checking yeah. in with Tennessee, see how bad they want a, a uh, quarterback. You never know what Washington's going to do. So right. there's, there's, there's lots of intriguing options for the Falcons if they stick or if they don't. But you said quarterback, you consider that. No. No. No, they're not they're not gonna not not with the number eight pick. Not gonna right. happen. And so and, and my and, thought and, and, is here's here's part of my rationale for saying that. The only quarterback they liked a couple years ago is Trevor Lawrence. Right. Right. Justin Fields, those guys not with where they were picking right at four. They weren't gonna go there. Would you say that draft class, which was pretty good, pretty good, is worse than this group? No. Nope. So I don't think that's right. why. That's why I think they've been so strong in committing to Desmond to take them out of the whole Lamar Jackson chatter, potential draft pick chatter. I think that's part of why you know I'm saying they're not going quarterback. There. Right. So the the Desmond Ritter, I cannot let you sit in this seat and not talk quarterback, yeah. right? I, I just can't do it. Um, the, the commitment to go with Desmond Ritter, you saw those four games. 
Uh, you know, you talk to people around the league when he was coming out, yep. 44 and 6 in college, what he's done and the decision. How do you evaluate the decision to be like, hey, we're going to go get an experienced backup in Taylor Heineke, who's been through it and taken a team through right. the second half of a season, but understands his role and let Desmond Ritter kind of run the show and make that. Uh, Arthur Smith said at the league meetings, like, we're not playing games here, right? That that's what we're going to do. What do you think of that move, that decision? Yeah, look, I, I, I mean, one, I, I salute them for, for being clear cut. Yeah. Right? They've got a plan. They're not what ifing, mm-hmm. right? So they're being clear cut. Um, we're going with Desmond, but I think it also they're saying themselves and uh, in, that they've probably got some type of assurances from Arthur Blank that if they don't go deep in the playoffs this year or whatever, they still have more time because if they felt that they were on the green mile this year, I think they would have been a little more urgent trying to get a veteran quarterback. Sure. There. Right, and, and so let's see if Desmond Ritter works. We're a run-first offense. We're not going to ask him to do too much while he develops. Right, we still have a young nucleus of players around him: the Algiers, the Drake Londons, the Kyle Pitts. So, if it doesn't work, then next year we're all in. Mm-hmm. Right, next year we might be able to get Lamar. Right. Next year we might be able to get some of these players who are coming up you know, uh, at the end of their rookie contracts, or there might be some guys in the draft who will use some capital that maybe they accrue this year right. to move up and go get a quarterback. So I, I think that's kind of the thinking that quarterback is, we want him to develop. We saw enough things. Arthur won with Ryan Tannehill. He did. Up in Tennessee. So maybe they they figure we don't need that elite guy. I would beg to differ because they didn't win a Super Bowl in Tennessee with Ryan Tannehill. Mm. You need that elite guy to win a Super Bowl. You're not beating Patrick Mahomes or Joey Burrow. Yeah. Um, you know, running the ball 35 times a game. You not gotta, when you, they can do it. They got to put points up on the board. I saw the Bengals live last year against the Falcons. My goodness. It's a, it's a <laughs> difficult <laughs> thing to handle. And they that, come and, at you so many different ways. And that quarterback, that dude, Joe, Joe Burrow is a different dude now. He is. He is. So we're talking about explosive offense. Yep. We've been, we've been proceeding logically, Steve, because that's what we like to do here. Yes. Can we just throw a wild card Let's do on the it. Table? Let's do it, man, because and I love this. There's B. John Robinson yep. is, I think, the wild card of this draft. Yep. Positional value, whatever the heck that means, says that running backs aren't worth top picks anymore, right, or whatever. But then you look at this guy play, and it kind of knocks you back. Yep. You know, maybe the one, he and Jalen Carter may be the top players in the draft. I don't know. I'm not a football expert. But you look at B. John Robinson – you look at the fact that the Falcons have taken away the desperation yep. aspect, and they've got Algier and they got CP, but only for one more year. Remember yep. our logic of guys on one-year deals don't affect the draft, right? Correct. So then you look at it and you think, I mean, Ar- what what Arthur Smith can do with a, a positionless sort of guy. I and love you think, how you're thinking. And it just – I, I love how you're thinking, I have one Scott. more mock draft to go, and I keep staring at the name Bijan Robinson. It's right there. I think, what if? It wouldn't. What I, if, right? And we were talking about it earlier. The one thing that would not shock me yeah, is if B. John Robinson's the eighth overall pick. If they take him. It wouldn't stun me whatsoever because he's a special talent. He can run the rock. He can line up wide and catch the rock. He's got all that versatility. And he's just one of those special players right when you look at him he's got kind of that adrian peterson stuff to him except he can catch the ball mm-hmm. so adrian peterson stuff but he can catch the ball that's the, the ball. nicest compliment you could possibly the, give. correct i mean wow. when, you, you talk, when will anderson said yeah when i had to try to tackle that dude that's that was a different player yeah okay I, that's that's telling you how good b john robinson is and in this scheme with the way they ran the ball last year with the way they blocked and set things up Man. I know, right? You just it's, start playing with it in, in your mind, and you're like, okay. So then Ritter would have Algier for the heavy stuff. He have Robinson, who can has as many uh, missed tackles forced as anybody in college football ever. And then you got Pitts maybe floating out here. You got Jonu in line. You got Drake London on the outside. And, and Cordero's, you draft your a ex, guy. Cordero's your X factor. There's, How do you stop that? I'm just kind of. <laughs> I'm just saying. I don't know. I'm just saying now they better score some points. Right. But. The defense is fortified, mm-hmm. you know, but you still say to yourself, 
If you get a stud edge rusher, you're going to get eight, nine years out of him. You get a stud running back, you're going to get four or five. I mean, we look Interesting. at it's it's the whole Saquon. That's the counter. It's the whole right? Saquon Barkley thing right now that you're going through. Like if that dude gets nicked, you're like, oh, you know, man, we we banked so much on that guy. Like the Giants, it was Saquon Barkley, and he got injured, and now they're franchise tagging him. Um, but I'm telling you, Scott, it's I, a that, fascinating discussion. It 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 would not it would not stun me at all if that happened. So we've taken the logical route. Yep. Both in the trade down, if you can get it, yep. the second class, or you stick at eight and you go get a, a stud cornerback and edge rusher, our premium positions. Right. And then we got this other thing. It's over there, here. though. And it, that's it, what it, I and think. It should, it should, that conversation should not go away. Right. And I think that's what makes where the Falcons are sitting. It's going to be such an interesting thing to see how the board falls, to see who's available, how many quarterbacks go up. That top ten with the Bears at nine, the, the oh, yeah. NFC champs at ten – of all places, that top 10 drafts are always fascinating. But I think this one, with the amount of different ways that it can go, is going to be really interesting. And the Falcons are sitting right there in the middle with a bunch of fun options. And if they took B. John Robinson, what that does to the picks after them. Oh, my gosh. Because it's pushing somebody back. Yep. If, if you get oh. four quarterbacks and a running back in oh. the top eight, it chaos ensues. That's where you see a team like the Chargers at 21 just jump right up like, okay, we're coming up to get some guys. So yeah. there's, there'll, there'll be some movement. But that's what I think is fascinating about what the Falcons have done to this point. Yep. And I kind of dig it, to be honest with you. The yeah. way they fortified this defense, they still need another wide receiver. There's There still needs to fill through the draft. If you look at last year's draft class, Arthur and Terry did a pretty good job with that they one. Did a really good job. Right. So can they duplicate it, right? Roster building, free agency is fun, and it's been a fun couple months around here, right, in terms of new guys coming in, but draft is your bedrock, right? So what they do next, what they did last year, how they build this roster, the young foundation, this draft is going to be fun. I mean, that's, 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 that's how you sustain. And right. what has Arthur Blank, the owner, said for the past two years? We have to come up with a sustainable winning formula. He does not want peaks and valleys. He wants to go on the type of run he had when Matt Ryan came in back when Mike Smith was coaching when they were perennial playoff contenders, played in the Super Bowl, he wants to revisit that that era, so to speak, one more right. time. And I think it's possible, assuming they keep taking advantage of their opportunities and using their assets well. So please stay tuned to AtlantaFalcons.com for a bunch of draft-related stuff. Also, rate review, positive rates ratings and reviews uh please and subscribe to the falcons podcast network for all of your post-draft analysis steve white again positive we're, reviews scott positive, positive reviews. reviews we're so stoked <laughs> that you joined us thank you so much for coming up and of obviously stay tuned to nfl network for all of steve's falcons and nfl analysis and we'll come back to you post-draft with another falcons final whistle see you